Blessings one and all, and welcome to the Mind's Eye Podcast. I'm Paul James Caden, and today on the show we are going to be talking about the power of contemplative prayer. Now this is a topic that goes right along with the discussions we've been having about mysticism. And since I shared that episode of the Vigil podcast here on the Mind's Eye, and we talked about, you know, why mysticism? Why is it important? I think this is a good follow up discussion to have because contemplative prayer goes hand in hand with mysticism. So, what is this thing called contemplative prayer? Well, there's a couple of different ways that we can do this. And the first way is very simple. And it's by reading the Bible. And as we read, we contemplate on the words that we're reading. What are they saying not only about the time in which Christ lived or the situation in which the Bible is talking about, but how does it apply to the world right now, what's happening in the world? How does it apply to my life? Now, some people, when they do contemplative prayer, or some refer to it as you know biblical meditation, They might read a passage, they might read a chapter very slowly, uh, pausing every couple of sentences and thinking about what's being said. So it it can be uh, a process that you dedicate some time to. And you can read as much or as little as you want. But most people... Uh, when it comes to contemplative prayer. See, in biblical meditation, many times people will also take one verse of Scripture and ponder it. For example, they may look at where Christ said, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And they will take 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes to ponder that. What does that mean to me? What is it saying to me? And in the process, we open ourselves up to the inspiration of God, the inspiration of the Spirit, to give us new insight into what that means, that the kingdom of God is in our midst. And some people, when they do contemplative prayer, They will use it as kind of a meditation practice as well. This is something that I do a lot, is I choose my verse from the scriptures. I sit, I close my eyes, and I just contemplate it. And when you contemplate it, you generally say it over and over to yourself in your mind. So as an example, I would sit, close my eyes, and just say, In my mind, to myself, the kingdom of heaven is in my midst. And I will just pause for a few moments and see what comes up in my thinking, what comes up in my consciousness. What insights am I gleaning? What new insights are coming to me that I never really thought of before when I'm contemplating the kingdom of heaven is in my midst? And then if I find that my mind starts drifting or, you know, I'm not getting anything new, you know, no new inspirations or insights, well, then say it again silently in your mind. The kingdom of heaven is in my midst. And then you stop and you ponder. What does that mean to me? What does that mean to the world that we're living in? What does it mean in some situation I may be facing in my life, whether that's a good or a bad situation or a challenge I need to overcome. And then when we find our mind might start drifting or there's nothing new that's coming to us, we say it again silently silently to ourselves, the kingdom of heaven is in my midst. 
And now you can do this with your eyes open or closed. Some people like to light a candle or light a candle and put on music, uh, you know, that's inspirational. Sometimes I do this. I'll just light a candle and I'll have like Gregorian chant music playing lowly in uh, the background while I do my contemplative prayer. But most times I will do it with my eyes closed. And when it comes to contemplative prayer, it doesn't necessarily have to be a passage from Scripture. It could be something you read in another book that's inspiring, a book on metaphysics, or maybe something, uh, if you read the Arantia book, as I do, something you read in there that you contemplate and mull over in your mind during that time of prayer. It could be a more metaphysical thought, uh, one that I heard a lot of people uh, do in uh, contemplative prayer. It, it's more of a metaphysical kind of saying, but if you do this, you'll find it's really interesting what comes to you and what starts happening in your own consciousness and how you start to perceive the world around you, how you start to perceive yourself. And that is contemplating this thought, saying to yourself, I am a thought in the mind of God. Now, when you really think about that, because this isn't something that's anti-biblical. All religions, whether it be Judaism, whether it be Islam, whether it be Christianity, there are many theologians who will say, well, one of the ways that we can describe God is the universal mind. You know, the, the infinite thought from which all things come into being. And many people, there, there are many who say that the word that God spoke is a metaphor for the thoughts that God projected to create the universes. And so when you think about that idea, I am a thought in the mind of God, and then it kind of expand on that, you know, the rest of the world, everybody else, my house, my backyard, my job that I go to, all of this is a thought in the mind of God. And it's incredible. I mean, no matter how you practice contemplative prayer, whether it's a verse from Scripture, whether it's a more metaphysical thought like, I am a thought in the mind of God, or something as as simple as, God is peace, or God is my healer. You know, some people like to uh, contemplate the names of God from the Old Testament. And uh, I, I don't uh, know all of them offhand, but if you go back and you see like Jehovah Rapha and things of this nature, which means, you know, God, my healer, God, my provider, some people just like to contemplate those names of God from the Old Testament and the things that will come to you in those moments. You just really start to get a better and greater understanding of yourself, of those around you, this material world that's around you. And you find that things that once concerned you and bothered you or made you mad or upset or afraid, it doesn't seem so very important anymore, and it doesn't have that impact that it once had. Because it's like you start seeing the reality behind reality. And you know that everything that's playing out on this material world stage really is uh, an illusion a thought in the mind of God. And this material thought 
this illusion that we live in is temporary. You as a spiritual being, you as a thought in the mind of God, a creation of the mind of God, you will leave this place one day and you will see mysteries and things you never dreamed possible. And so you start to see reality for what it is and the things of this world don't have such an effect or a sting on you as they once did. So now again, why is this important? It's important because prayer as we know it um, has really been kind of hijacked over the centuries. You know, a lot of the early Christians and those individuals who uh, we call the Desert Fathers, uh, they engaged more in contemplative prayer than prayers of petition. You know, we've been groomed in modern-day society uh, to think prayer is this asking God for things all the time. God, give me money. God, help me get that job. God, help me get that house. God, I want that new car. God, if you'll just bring my boyfriend or my girlfriend back, I'll never ask for another thing. I'll be so happy. We're always asking, asking, asking. And now there's nothing wrong with asking God for help. You know, when it comes to healing, when it comes to having our needs met, to say, hey, God, I, I could use uh, some help in this situation. There's nothing wrong with that. But our modern day prayer life has become saturated with the asking for stuff and things all of the time. We very seldom just sit with God and know God on a personal, intimate level. And that, in a nutshell, is, is what mysticism is all about. And the funny thing about it is, when we start engaging in this contemplative prayer, we start to see things working out in our lives before we even ask. And it reminds me of the words that Jesus spoke when he said, you know, where is your faith? You know, look at the birds of the air, look at the lilies of the field. They don't toil or spin, you know, or work. And, you know, your heavenly father provides for them. You know, how much more will he provide for you? And so we have this idea, which is also something that's very prevalent in mysticism, is meditating on nature and seeing the attributes of the creator in the creation. And one, and you know, we're not going to get into all that right now, but looking at nature, we see that the natural creation is in tune with the spirit and the will of God, just the way he made it. The rains water the grass, the seeds grow, the seeds provide food, all the different insects that feed the birds. I mean, there's a whole food chain that exists, and none of these creatures, none of these plants or animals or insects, well, we don't see them getting up every morning and going to a job, you know, uh, giving one another money, you know, to uh, get their food supply. Uh, we don't see them hanging out, you know, on our clothesline, you know, uh, the dragonfly saying, oh, God, please send me a gnat today. <laughs> you know, the, those things are just provided. And, you know, I, I'm not saying, of course, you know, trust God, don't work and wait for everything to fall in your lap because 
that's certainly non-productive and, and just out of ignorance as well. And there are some people who do that sort of thing, and that's not what mysticism or con- contemplative prayer or being in harmony with the presence of God is all about either. But you'll find when you engage in contemplative prayer, things work themselves out without you have to ask ask all the time. And this is because you're in tune with the presence and the energy and the spirit of the divine. You're existing in a different atmosphere now. You're having a different mindset. You're seeing the world differently. Your expectations are differently, are different. Things affect you in a different way. Where you were once afraid or angry or stressed, you don't feel those things anymore. You cross that line within yourself where you enter that peace of God that surpasses all understanding, or you're entering the rest of God. You're entering God's rest. And in that new atmosphere, you just begin to really understand and know that, yes, you're you're going to have challenges in this world. Yes, you know, none of us are going to live a charmed life. You know, things are going to happen. You know, we're going to have struggles. We're going to have trials. We're going to deal with getting older and illness and the prospect uh, of dying one day. But you see those things differently. And you're living in that different spiritual atmosphere where. As Jesus said, your heavenly Father knows what you have need of before you even ask him. And it just becomes an unspoken, understood thing between you and God. He knows you need the job. He knows the things that you want, the things that you need. But see, you're focusing your time now in understanding more about God, deepening your love of God. And look at that in a human relationship, if we might use that as an example. How would you feel if you had a husband, a wife, children, friends, whoever, somebody that you're really close to, And every time you see them, they tell you that they love you, but most of the conversations you have, or all of the conversations you have with these people who you love dearly, and they're very special to you, the conversation consists mostly of them telling you what they want, or asking you for things you would start to feel kind of like you're being used. You would start to feel like maybe there's no substance to this relationship. Because though they're saying, oh, you know, I love this person so much, I love you so much, every time you see them, it's help me with this, do that for me. Do you have money you can give me? Do you have that you can give me? Can you get me a new car? Can you help me get this job? You know, everything is a request. Now, God is far beyond all of that. You know, he's not a human being that looks at us and says, oh, you know, they're just using me. He knows we're fallible, we get caught up in different mindsets and desperations and sometimes the things we want aren't necessarily the things that we need. God understands all of that. But just as an example, now think about that relationship where the person you really care about and love doesn't ask you for ever anything. 
the conversation consists of just talking and them telling you how much they love you and understanding you in unconditional love and just being there in your presence with you is reward enough for them. Think about that as a human being, how we would look at such a person and say, man, they're such a good person. You know, I love them so much and they love me so much. They make me happy. I would do anything for them. And you do. Before they even ask if their car breaks down and you have the wherewithal, well, can I help you get a new one? If they need help, you're the first one there to say, I'm here, what do you need? Now think about how much greater that kind of relationship is with God. Rather than asking, asking, asking all day, all the time. And sometimes for such silly things. You know, there's people that go and pray to God, please, you know, my boss is an idiot. You know, uh, could you make him lose his job so I can get it because I'm next in line? They pray for, you know, such trivial things like their favorite sports team to win. You know, we we toss prayer around like it's a wishbone or, or something, you know, that uh, we just throw it out there and, you know, maybe we'll get the... Uh, the uh, the larger end of the wishbone, and hey, you know, our, our, our wish will come true, you know? And that's not what prayer is all about. But if we just really contemplate God, contemplate his word, his nature, his character, and we get those deeper insights, and our consciousness begins... Our spiritual consciousness begins to expand and grow. You know, we're in a completely different um, atmosphere and relationship with the divine. Now, there is a way to use a contemplative prayer for uh, making requests or putting what some would say a little more um, manifesting faith behind a thought, uh, but that's something that uh, maybe we'll talk about in the future. But for right now, it's it's important to know that this contemplative prayer is a very powerful thing. It it literally does change you, the world around you. It puts you in a position where. Your needs can be met, just naturally, because God knows what you have need of in your life. But the biggest rewards is just the peace and the calm and the knowing that comes along with it. You know, too much of our uh, religion in this day and age is is all about the pomp and the circumstance you know people standing behind the podium you know screaming out you know the name of jesus you know and, you know all of that sort of thing you know berating those listening to them about what sinners they are you know it's all about rituals and confessions and uh, you know making sure you're saying the right formulaic prayers, you know, from the ancient past. But do any of these things bring us closer to God? Do any of these things expand our consciousness? Now, they can if we use them correctly, but if we just use them as a formula or a ritual that we do because we think it's going to make us more pleasing to God because the church or a church told us so, you know, then we're getting farther and farther away from what is contemplative prayer and uh, the powerful effects that it can have on our lives. And understand this too, that you are the church. 
The church is not a building. The church is not an organization. The Bible says that the church of Christ will be built out of living stones. That's you and I. God dwelling in us. And that's where your focus should be to find God and to find those deeper answers and understanding that you seek. See, everything everything is exterior in our religions. Go to the church. Come to the church. Receive communion by eating this wafer. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. And I take mystical communion in my own home um, regularly. Though my focus might be uh, a bit different than what it is in, in most churches when I do it. Um, But, you know, everything is external. Everything is out there. It's beyond us. It's outside of us. It's in the church. It's in the job. It's with that pastor. It's with that prophet. It's with that teacher online and his great wisdom that he's wowing everybody with. We're taught to look everywhere except within. And that's mysticism. And that's contemplative prayer. It's looking within, connecting with the Spirit of God that resides right within your own heart and mind and soul. And you know, I often wonder that is that why over the centuries uh, mysticism has gotten such a bad rap? So many, uh, especially in Protestantism and evangelical Christianity, so many people, oh, mysticism, that's from the devil. You know, mysticism, well, that's just a bunch of weird stuff. You don't want to get into that because you can be misled. You know, that's heresy. That's blasphemy. That's, you know, all these terrible tags they hang on it. But what is it really? It's going within. It's connecting with the presence and the love of God that's all around you and within you. Doesn't the Bible say God is in us? Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within us and the kingdom of heaven is in our midst. But we're always taught, no, it's here. It's in this meeting. It's in this church. It's here. It's there. You know, we need to do all these exterior things. And I wonder if that's maybe on purpose. You know, a little bit of a conspiratorial thinking there. But, you know, have some of these big religious organizations tried to fade mysticism out so people would be more dependent on them? Because after all, if everybody understood and knew that God was right there with them, God was within them. Well, might our religion look quite different? But see, I think egos take over and human beings have to get up in front of the crowd and preach their sermon and, you know, uh, try to wow everybody with how uh, impressive and knowledgeable they are. There's nothing wrong with coming together as a church, as a group, reading the scriptures, having a short message, and then just contemplating the kingdom of God in our midst, in our hearts. Too much attention on the exterior and almost none on the interior. And this is why we can have so many people going over the falls in a barrel uh, with, you know, the false prophecies that just happened over the uh, the latest presidential election, you know, people following things like QAnon. And I was talking to a friend of mine uh, online uh, just today who said, you know, she had a friend that was into all that stuff. And, uh, you know, there were some Christians saying, well, you know, it's time to, to repent because All of this was a lot of false prophecy and a lot of ego, you know, mixed up in politics, masquerading as the uh, 
the uh, you know the spirit of God and the word of God or the you know the prophecies of God. And this person said, "No, I, I will never repent." And I've heard uh, and seen quite a few people say that. You know, that's ego. That's what all of the exterior focus eventually leads us to. It always comes back to me, the I, the ego, what I say, what I believe, what I want. And then we fall under this spiritual delusion that what I think, what I believe, what I want, what I think is right. Well, that's what God thinks. That's what God wants. That's what God believes is right too. So then we start speaking our own desires in the name of the Lord. And it's not coming from a place of spirit whatsoever. So this is why we talked about in the last podcast why mysticism is important. And this is why uh, things such as contemplative prayer is important, why it's powerful. It really starts to put us in touch and at one with that presence and that love of God, which also takes us into the knowledge and the wisdom of God that is beyond our human comprehension. And it never, ever inflates the ego, no matter what it is that you may glean or get in your times of meditation or contemplative prayer, you can always tell when it's the real McCoy because you're humbled by it. You're humbled by it. You don't... You don't look at other people and start saying, I know more than they do. What a wonderful mystic or pastor or prophet I am. You, you just don't do it. Sometimes you might get a word for somebody else that'll come to mind that, gee, maybe I should tell my brother or my next door neighbor that's going through a hard time. You know, this, you know, they came to mind during my contemplative prayer. You know, this information might help. So we share that and then we leave it be. But most of that stuff we get, it's going to be personal to our lives and a little treasure and a little gem that we share with those maybe few individuals we come across that we can share it with and they understand what we're talking about or it's something they needed to hear to get their life on track, to heal their life. So it's never an ego thing. You'll never feel pumped up how... Uh, thinking how important you are when you're really getting that information, when you're really gleaning that knowledge and making that connection with God. You'll never become full of self. You'll become full of God. And God is love. God is peace. God is no respecter of persons. And God's ways are so much higher than our ways. So I hope you got something out of this show today, as usual. I appreciate you listening. I do these podcasts to just try to provide a little service to God and to help people because it's a crazy, crazy world out there. And, uh, you know, I hope that these are seeds well planted in someone's life and that if they help you, Take the information and help someone else. It's starting the the chain reaction of love, kindness, and human decency. And that's very important for all of us to do. So again, thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Until next time, stay safe, stay well, and uh, practice contemplative prayer. I think you'll be very surprised on... The results you have, uh, particularly in the inner landscape, how you think, how you feel, how you look at life. And I will talk to you next time here on the Mind's Eye Podcast.